pioneering solutions, transformational technology, and inspirational leaders. I'm your host, Connor Sherman, and this is the Confident Defense Podcast. Welcome to the Confident Defense Podcast. I'm your host, Connor, and today our guest is Brian Kerr. Brian is the VP of Security at Clavio, the premier marketing automation platform for any business that sells online. Brian is a security executive with over a decade of building and running high performance teams and is a trusted voice on cybersecurity councils at multiple VC firms. Brian, welcome to the show. Hey, Connor, good to be here. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate you jumping on. I know you've got an incredibly busy schedule. So for you to carve out and come share some of your insights is pretty fantastic and very generous of you. So one of the things that we've been talking about, one of the reasons I want to get you on the show is because in addition to your breadth of, you know, experience as a leader and a practitioner, you've got this really incredible knack of being able to find talent in unlikely places where somebody may look at a resume and they'll just pass on because that person doesn't have the right pedigree. You're able to kind of like, see, no, there's something behind that. And this individual has like the hunger, the drive, the creativity to really become something more. So you shared a story with me. I was hoping we could start there where you found a security analyst who had that intrinsic sense about them and really transform someone in their career from being a finance analyst to a security leader at a tech firm. So can you walk us through that story and how it is you're able to identify and find talent in unlikely places? Yeah, I, I, I think that case was was really lucky to draw, but uh, effectively this particular individual was a wizard in Excel. And at that point in time, I had just pivoted from kind of being a consultant and doing advisory work to kind of moving to an internal role. And as part of that was, hey, get your, you know, we had a small security team, it was myself and another individual, right? And, you know, we had to go through user access reviews and big tech company, ton of different applications that we were using and wanted to validate that one access was commensurate with responsibilities. In addition, we had no termed employees that had access to, to systems and tools, right? And I myself was by no means an Excel wizard. And uh, somebody pointed me into this gentleman's direction and basically provided him with, with all the data, let him know what needed to get done. And you know, five minutes later, he returned, you know, perfectly formatted, all the information that I required in, in the access review made my life so much easier, right? Prior to that, I was one of those individuals, I was just going, you know, I want to be so detailed. I was going one by one reviewing users, their roles, in addition to, um, you know, whether or not they were an active employee. And he basically made my life that much easier. Um, long story short, you know, got word that he was really interested in security and he wasn't interested in continuing to be, you know, in a financial analyst role. When we got additional headcount organizationally, it was pretty easy to kind of pull him over to the team. Since then, I mean, he basically started, you know, moved from finance into governance versus compliance. Um, from there, he, when I departed that organization, he basically took over the entire GRC program, which at Aqua was pretty big, right? It was FedRAMP. It was PCI compliance. It was HIPAA. It was you know SOC one, SOC two. Um, in addition to ISO twenty seven thousand one, so he basically ran that entire program. Uh, he's since left there. He's since departed. Now he's running his own security team. Um, pretty incredible story. Yeah, that is. That's it's amazing. I love the fact that you've got someone who's got one very tangible, very valuable skill, which is this data analytics in even just basic um, Excel work, right? V lookups, you know. Yeah, everyone knows how to do that. Really? Do you? So when you find someone who's got that level of skill and then giving them the opportunity to grow, um, you know, you talk about like, yes, they ran the governance function, but the way you positioned it, like that's mission critical work. Like for some organizations, if you're regulated and you don't hit your targets, you're not in compliance with that, that's going to have a direct impact to revenue. That's going to have a direct impact to, are you able to continue to operate in those markets? So going from finance analyst to someone who's running mission critical GRC to now running in their own uh, security teams, that's pretty fantastic. Well, I think there's two things as, as you know, and a lot of practitioners understand, right? There's that level of curiosity, I think that makes people successful within this industry. And, and Matt demonstrated all that curiosity. He always wanted to learn more and he was a self starter, right? And what I mean by that is he was the last person to ask a question about anything until he had done all the work, all the research he possibly could, right? So um, learning everything about the requirements and the, you know, the frameworks in which we operated over at Aquio, right? So understanding FedRAMP, understanding ISO, understanding, you know, the SOC requirements, um, understanding HIPAA, he'd teach himself, 
right? And and that's just who he was. He was always learning, right? And you know, at, at Clavio, one of our organizational models is to always be learning, right? One of our core values. Um, but that's what he demonstrated. And I think you know, Connor, what's interesting is is we have a lot of talks within the industry, and there's a lot of LinkedIn posts around you know this this shortage of talent, and it's interesting. It's an interesting topic of conversation because there's a lot of different opinions on it. One, I'd love to get your take on it. But, you know, what, what I'm seeing is that it comes down to kind of the business and the business's understanding of where security fits in organizationally. Mm-hmm. And then it falls into the security leaders within that organization and how they want to hire and how they want to tackle certain initiatives, right? So if I'm at a different organization that is restricted from security resources, right? I only have one headcount for, for 2021 per se. Well, yeah, I'm going to go look for somebody that is a golden nugget, right? I'm going to go look for that diamond in the rough that has all sorts of skills because I'm adding to a small security program. On the flip side, when you have a well-funded security program, you have the ability to take additional chances on more junior resources, right? So I think there's a balance, you know, when we talk about the shortage within, within the industry, is that it's not necessarily a shortage in, in, in my personal opinion. I think it's that certain teams are so restricted that they don't have the opportunity to take those types of chances. They don't have the opportunity to go in and take yeah. somebody fresh out of college and teach them because there's so much work that they need to do in their underfunded program where you see the well-funded programs, right? If you think through like the banks of the world, you don't think Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan Chase are being attacked by adversaries on a daily basis. No, they have well-funded security programs. They have the ability to respond and they have the ability to go attract top talent and teach that top talent as they come out of their, their schools and their educational programs. I think that's a really good insight, actually. The difference between do we not have enough people versus do we not have enough proven people? And that I sense that like if you have, if your program is well-funded or just let's call it appropriately funded. I think a lot of programs still suffer from just appropriate funding. And part of appropriate funding is, do you have the ability to take a chance on someone come forward? I mean, we kind of see the effects of this inability to take risks. It's probably one of the reasons why, you know, from a, we have conversations on the podcast around um, diversity, equity, inclusion, right? And how we really do scale into a place where we're not as balanced and as healthy in that space. So we want to be as a security community. Well, why? I think you're touching on something. It's because if you have such a limited resources, you can't take you can't go for someone who you see potential in, but doesn't have the track record. You have to buy the track record. And that tenderly skews you into someone who's come through a traditional line, a traditional pedigree forward. Um, so I think that's, that's a really interesting insight. Um, and just to kind of dovetail on that, you asked, um, what I go back to this gentleman is, for all the listeners, what I saw in this gentleman was he had a skill in which, and then he, which was like the, just being total wizard at Excel, right? Sounds small and you marry that with the um, personality of the individual and marry it with the, the, the non-tangibles of the individual, such as curiosity, self-driven, self-learning. This goes back to what um, Stefan Semmelroth had said on the podcast um, a few episodes ago, where he was saying that if you're trying to move into the security community and trying to get a role in security, don't start over. Figure out what you're great at today and then go find a need on that in the security community and then go learn from there, right? Use the skills and tools you have, hop over, solve that problem, and then learn the rest of the security trade. We're, we're currently doing something very similar at, at Clavio right now, right? Where we have an individual on our IT team and she's a great resource to, to the organization, but she's got a real big curiosity security, right? So, you know, we have endless conversations and, and one of the approaches that we take, right, is at, at Clavio, and I push this down in the various teams that, that, that I manage over there is, if you're interested in one field, my job as a leader is to get you to work in that particular field. If you wanna leave IT and go work in marketing, my job as a leader is to try to get you a role in marketing to help you further your career, whether that's in security or whether that's in another kind of part of the business or if if that's in a completely different organization, right? My job, I always view it as I'm trying to help you get to where you wanna go. Um, But this this one woman that that we work with right now, um, she's got a lot of curiosity when it comes to, to security, right? So what she's done is, and, and we make ourselves available to say, hey, you know, check my, check my calendar, yeah. stock it. If there's any meetings that you want to partake in, anything you want to learn, jump into that meeting. Ask if you could attend that particular meeting. There's obviously going to be some of those meetings that you're not going to be able to attend, right? But for the most part, show that, that ambition, that drive to be in the security community, um, which she's done. So right now, what we have her doing is we got a lot of phishing emails that come in, right? Easily reported by our user base. 
she's going and she's doing all the investigations for phishing emails now, right? So one, it benefits our security operations team because they're not inundated with the you know, yeah. frequent influx of phishing emails that come in. Um, but two, there's a lot of learning opportunity for this particular woman on our IT team who eventually wants to move over to security. And to yeah. me, it's, it's those individuals that you know, grab the bull by its horns and show that they're passionate or that they wanna learn something that you really wanna drive and give that opportunity to. Um, so we're going to continue to work with this particular individual and hopefully, you know, similar to, to the, to the finance analysts coming over to the team, we'll have somebody from, from core IT kind of moving over and, and working either on our SecOps team or, or governance risk and compliance, as we call it at Clavia, our risk and trust team. So, yeah, by the way, I love the fact you call it risk and trust, because at the end of the day, the whole point of a security program is to foster trust with whomever it is that you're engaging with. So, uh, Anyway, just love that. Love the fact you're doing that. So talk to me about your uh, background here, right? You started your journey in Canada and you became a security leader and you moved your way, like, so from Canada to the Northeast in the security space, like, how did you end up here in the Northeast, part of multiple, on the cyber council of multiple VCs? Um, how did that journey tie together? Um, athletics. Uh, so, so hockey brought me to the U.S., um, kind of went to, to school in, in upstate New York. So I was playing college hockey and kind of senior year started applying for, for roles. A lot of folks from, from the school I went to, Union College, um, small little school in upstate New York, worked in, in the finance industry. Um, but there were a bunch of folks on the hockey team that were working in the cyber assurance teams over at, in advisory teams over at PwC. Um, so applied to, to a bunch of roles, um, you know, had a bunch of interviews, both in banking in addition to... Uh, just some interviews at PwC and just, just loved what PwC had to offer. It was just really interesting to me. And, um, you know, once again, the, the inner curiosity of kind of what these individuals are working on really drove me to kind of um, accept that job. That moved me to Boston. So big, been, been in Boston since I graduated from college. Absolutely love it. Live in the suburbs now with my wife and, and two kids. Um, but essentially, you know, started my career off at C PwC in what's now called their cyber assurance or cyber advisory group. Um, a lot of it was working on fortune companies. And I think one of the benefits of, of the path that I've taken, which is very different from a lot of security leaders or, or similar to some security leaders for that matter, is um, the ability to learn how the different environments work for global, well-recognized organizations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I could look back to, to my three years that I spent there, I wish I had learned even more. PwC was a great learning spot. You had all the resources in the world from a learning development perspective to, to learn absolutely everything around you know cybersecurity. Amazing. Um, from there, you know, I had a curiosity on on more kind of the sales side, right? PwC is very structured and kind of how you work and the visibility you get in the sales process. Like, oh, well, I want to I want to learn more about sales. I want to learn more about the business side of the house, where I didn't get that much visibility when I was at PwC. And there was a small boutique advisory firm based in Tampa, Florida, that reached out. Um, kind of went down there, interviewed. And I remember sitting in an office and, you know, it was, it was, it definitely wasn't to the class and sophistication of, of PwC, but the learning opportunity was there and the curiosity of, okay, what's it, what's it going to be like to be the 25th employee hired to this small advisory firm that's, that's starting off in, in Tampa, Florida. Um, so took a leap of faith and, and that's where I really got the bug for, for young companies. Um, move, moved down five, seven years, uh, a good friend of mine who I had worked at at, at PwC, in addition to at, at this company, um, took a, a leadership role at Acquia and needed to build out kind of the, the risk and trust function or the governance risk and compliance function, mm -hmm. reached out to me, um, rest is history. Uh, at that point in time, we had, we had had my daughter and you know the, the, the endless hours working in kind of advisory capacity, providing reports, was just, you know, pretty tiring. The computer was always on and, you know, my wife was always doing all the parenting. And, you know, I, I remember looking at my wife saying, hey, this, it, it's not fair, right? And it's not fair to my daughter either. But um, that aside, kind of, you know, jumped into to the internal role and um, been doing that ever since. So ended up taking over and, and running the whole uh, security function at Acquia, left Acquia, did the same thing, built the security function at Catalan Technologies, another local Boston-based tech company. And, and luckily enough, I'm, I'm in a phenomenal spot here at Clavio right now. Yeah. And you guys are actively changing the face of how companies work online during COVID. Like there's a lot of incredible things that you're doing at that, this company here at Clavio. Now, what I find is interesting is this is not the first time I've heard of someone's career going from like big organizations and getting smaller. And 
you know, just as I've been thinking this through, like one of the questions I always ask myself is I'm listening to the guests give all their insights. I'm like, well, what would I tell my younger brothers? Like if they were going through this process and part of their career, and I would say, don't shy away from larger structured organizations earlier in your career and recognize that as you get better at your craft and your skill set, you can always go to smaller, more nimble, more agile companies. I think yep. sometimes people have that desire, like I want to work, you know, the next Google before it's Google. And so they jump into the 10 man show or 10 person show. And then they've lost like five years of where they could really learn how enterprises work. They could really learn and have what you mentioned at PwC, which was an endless learning opportunity. So there's always pros and cons and it's best to find the right thing that works for you. But I would say just like, I know it's cool to not work at a big company, but like there are great things when you're starting in your career working in these larger institutions. Couldn't have said it any better. I think to, to your point, Connor, right? One, one of the things that you learn as you continue to mature throughout your career is, is what you do like and what you don't like, right? Do you like the bureaucratic setup within a company, right? The big, massive organization, or do you like using your words again, kind of the, the agile organization, right? The organization that's working really fast. Um, but you only get that through the experiences that you, that you work through. And, you know, one of the things that I learned at PwC that had followed me throughout my career is my role regardless of where I am in an organization is to make my boss's life easier. I will never forget that piece of advice. And that is what I pass down to young employees, um, kids in college that reach out that I talk with um, is your job is to make your boss's life easier. So, you know, the PwC structure an associate's job is to make the senior associate's life easier. Senior associate, the manager, manager, the director, or senior manager, and the senior manager, director, the partner, right? And kind of leveraging that philosophy, what can I do to make Connor's life that much easier, right? What can I do from a pre preparation perspective? What can I take off his plate to make his life that much easier? And I think when you when you go down that path and you start thinking of it that way, you really kind of put yourself in a position to augment and, and push your career forward. Um, just just great piece of advice. But but turning back to kind of some of the learnings over at PwC was, um, you know, the learning and development. There was a complete platform that you can learn anything you wanted to. There were endless resources in the event that you wanted to travel to go to, you know, three-day boot camp around networking, or if you wanted to go to a boot camp around uh, SAP implementations. Right, the learning opportunities were just tremendous. And and looking back on it and where I am now, I wish I had done so much more of that. Now you're booked to clients, and you had to do it when you had some free and downtime, yeah. right? But at the end of the day, there's so many areas right now that I'm like the drive I have to continue to be learning, I wish I had to take in better opportunity. Clavio is a phenomenal spot once again. I mean, there's only great things I could say is, as I mentioned earlier, one of our core values is to always be learning. Every year, every employee has a $3,000 stipend to go towards learning. Um, sweatshirt I'm wearing right now is, is Clavio University, right? And this is kind of a product of when you pass um, our marketing 101 program. Um, which get, teaches you all the core concepts of, of marketing. But on the flip side, it shows you one, you know, what our customers go through, right? And it's really important for us to be empathetic towards what our customers are going through. And on the cybersecurity side, how does that translate? Well, Clavio has some sort of security events, some sort of security incident that impacts our customers. Well, that not only impacts our customer, that impacts our brand, right? Impacts yep. our reputation, impacts our potential growth. It then potentially impacts our customers in their business, right? Because now all of a sudden they need to reach out to the consumers where they store some sort of, you know, PII, right? Name, potential mailing address, maybe a phone number and say, hey, we use this third-party tool called Clavio. They had a security incident. We need to yes. notify you about this, right? And we need to have empathy there. We need to fully understand that, hey, like when our team or when our organization has some sort of event or incident, that has the ability to impact our customers' brands themselves. And that's a really powerful thing. And, you know, luckily, once again, we, we're, we're at a great spot where we're, you know, a funded program, we've got good resources, and, and we're doing some pretty great things right now. Yeah, and that's a really good point. Being understanding the, understand the business of what you're protecting and that whole, then the value chain of the one where you sit inside that value chain. So in your case, you mentioned Clavio, it's like, you're, you're part of somebody else's brand experience. So there's the customers talking to them and then you're helping them enable that. You know, companies that I've worked for, very similar. Like we're part of a value chain here and we have our job to do as security leaders to not just protect our company, but also check our customers in their customers and, their, and the chain goes on and on and on. Exactly. So there is a ripple effect to when we get it right and there's a ripple effect to when we get it wrong. 
um, or more importantly, when an adversary shows up, because it's not, you know, let's be careful who we blame here. Um, so let's talk about that, right? So one of the things that makes, you know, puts us both a security agent in a position where we can really drive business and scale is this whole cloud computing space. So I'm going to transition into this, right? There are unique challenges that come when you have an environment that is as agile and that is cloud native, that is agile as adopting um, these modern practices, which, you know, we're all very encouraging of, but it, be, it has its own sort of risk profile with it. So can we talk about your experience of like laying a solid foundation uh, for a security program that's at a high tech, high growth space? And what are some of the lessons learned or insights you might have around doing cloud security well? Like, what are some of the things that have really stuck out? It's like, okay, if I had one thing, like I want to make sure everybody listening to this podcast does this in their environment. I want to make sure everybody's doing these basics in place. Uh, uh, which, which is worse, it sounds like. Um, you know, <laughs> pick, pick, pick one area that you need to, uh, need to select. Um, I, think, I think everything starts with education, right? I, th I think that is a, a core fundamental when it comes to information security. Um, that's educating the end users and not only educating the end users in, in you know, let's call them Clavios in, in my area that, you know, hey, there are bad people out there that are trying to do bad things, right? But educating them for their personal lives as well. So mm -hmm. phishing campaigns, phishing is a, is a great example, right? How do I teach the organization to protect against phishing? Well, you know, we have phishing simulations, we have phishing training, we have blog articles, you know, we post them on our wiki, we notify the organization through, you know, communication channels in the event that we're seeing an active campaign taking place. But being able to educate the user how to identify, you know, a potentially malicious email, teach them that, hey, what an adversary is trying to do is use human psychology against you, right? Add that level of pressure to make you operator do something that they want you to do click on this link wire this money right and the pressure that it comes so educating the user base to me is is one of the first and most important steps when it comes to any sort of security program you can even take it away from there from from an engineering perspective right having you know the core engineering team understanding OWASP vulnerabilities and why input sanitation is extremely important right because then when we go back to the phishing or we go back to kind of, you know, engineering and, and building a web application, you can take the, the next step, right? What have we done from a security perspective to mitigate the risk of a malicious email from making into somebody's box, right? SPF records, DKIM, DMARC, great. You know, from, from the engineering perspective, what do we have in the pipeline to review, you know, uh, what do we have from a static code analysis? What do we have from, for, a, you know, a, a DAS tool, right? Um, and then, you know, back to, back to phishing. Okay, well, an email's passed through those protections, right? And an end user has clicked on a link. Well, what does the end user know and how are they educated on how to report that? In addition to, if some sort of executable is running, what do we have in place? What does the security team put in place to detect that and prevent it from executing, right? So we've deployed laptop protections. So, you know, the, 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 where I'm going with all this is essentially the education component is extremely important. And once you have the education part, in, in my view, you can then build on safeguards organizationally that you have that defense in depth, right? You have the education, the end user should be able to flag in, you know, a malicious email. Um, you've protected the ability of that email getting into your inbox through kind of what I mentioned earlier. And then in the event it passes through some of those safeguards, you also have, you know, some preventative tools in place on the employee laptop that will prevent any executable from running. So you've got that layered defense at that particular point, right? But yeah. if you're just going to leverage technology to try to solve a solution, you're completely missing out on, on a big opportunity, which That's is kind of the education component of, of, of the end user, because they're not going to have certain tooling for their personal Gmail account. They're not going to have that tooling if they have a, a Microsoft, you know, 365 personal email account, right? Mm -hmm. they're not, they may not have, you know, some sort of laptop protection on their personal device. That's a really good point. And then I'm going to clarify, like what you just described there was like really finding an attack sequence, mapping it across the kill chain and saying, okay, Let's make sure we have defense in depth, right? Can we detect it? Can we protect? Can we respond? Can we recover? Like across the entire life cycle. And then when then you've got like the tech stack there. And then what you're highlighting here is really powerful. It's like, let's not also forget the best piece of AI we have as human intelligence, right? It's the ability to have trained individuals. And it doesn't have to be just a security team. It could be, as you were talking about with the OS top 10, getting into the engineering team and having security champions, 
going out to the end user base and doing that a continuous phishing training in, in that particular case and kind of democratizing the security team and expanding out the eyes and ears of everyone because we're all protecting the same company at the end of the day. But I think you're right. Like if we forget about the training, we overly skew towards technology. We're leaving all of these resources that could help the company, the humans, just on the table and we're not operationalizing them at all. Yeah, hundred percent. And, 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 you know, I'm, you know, if you think through from kind of an application development perspective, right. You know, once again, it's been a while, but you know, I, I don't believe, and I could be wrong. I don't believe any sort of security training is required within, uh, you know, engineering programs within universities. I don't think it's a mandatory course that, that engineers need to take. I've heard more to the opposite people complaining. It's not right. So to it's in defense, what, what you're it, saying. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, we need to educate when they come on board around secure coding practices, right? Um, because you can't just say, okay, well, we're going to protect the environment through the application of a, of a WAF, right? Because once again, it's the, the WAF is, is that defense and depth layer, right? You have secure coding practices, you have peer code reviews, you have pipeline tooling. And on top of all that, you have the WAF, right? So you have what we're talking through this defense and depth um, to me is, is, is extremely important kind of when you're, when you're building a security program. Um, you know, a, a lot of what else we do kind of over at Clavio is, is just, you know, what I call the fundamentals, right? Identity and access management, you know, onboarding, offboarding, access permissioning, um, logging and monitoring, making sure we have the appropriate log data flowing in, making sure we have the ability to create alerts, making sure we understand what anomalous activity is, um, you know, how we're hardening our environment, not only kind of you know, are we, are we meeting the CIS Ubuntu benchmarks or, you know, the, the Red Hat benchmarks, but are we meeting the AWS account configuration benchmarks? What are we doing adding, you know, once again, that, that defense and depth to prevent the intro introduction of misconfigurations into an environment, right? You know, AWS has some cool inherent tooling with organizations and service control policies that, you know, some smaller companies that I advise with aren't leveraging right now. And, you know, those are really powerful tools to say, hey, we're going to prevent enabling an S3 bucket to be open to the world through that service control policy. You can try to click that flag, but it's not gonna happen, it's not gonna work, right? So there's a lot of layers, you know, and, and you know, once again, it goes kind of to the educational component to the various leaders within the organization to say, hey, there's a lot of native tooling in place that we could leverage in order to protect an organization. Yeah, I mean, I I've, I've, was working with a company uh, about a year ago and I said, great, do you have like the basics on like, you know, do you have your NetFlows turned on in an AWS environment? Do you have guard duty turned on? Do you have two-factor authentication turned on for your, right. to all your accounts? Do you have a hardware token for your 2FA on your root account? And these are just like fundamentals that you'd get out of like the CIS um, AWS benchmark. And the answer was a glaring no. So to even just do those fundamentals, like focusing on those fundamentals was a massive win for that organization at that time. So I love that idea of like laying a foundation down that's safe and then building on top of that. Um, but yeah, like, I like what you said there about, again, it comes back to education. Right? There may just be all these latent tools native within platforms that the engineers will have a better insight to because they're working in it day in, day out. And so if we somehow recruited them through some education, through security championships and said, hey, we've got to solve these problems, they might say, oh, hey, we're not using service control policies. We should probably do that. Let's go explore that option. Yep. Yep, exactly. 100%. So Brian, You've got this really interesting perspective. You sit on the venture cap, you sit on the cybersecurity advisory boards for multiple venture capital companies. What do you think venture capital's role is in discovering and unlocking talent and innovation in cybersecurity? Luckily enough, it's not just myself as part of these councils, right? They, they definitely don't want to hear me. Um, they probably want to hear all the other, you know, great CISOs that are that are on those councils other than myself. Um, those are definitely the voices they want to hear. But so all, in, in all seriousness, I think what you're starting to see with the, with the VC firms are doing is they're starting to bring in security leaders in all different industries, all different verticals to the table as part of these councils, right? And I think what they're doing is allowing us to communicate very clearly hmm. to these extremely creative entrepreneurs the pain points that we feel in our environments and then help these entrepreneurs in the direction that they're gonna push their new product, where they wanna go, where we see the pitfalls. Um, most recently, we had a great conversation around DLP tooling and the challenges of, of DLP tooling. Um, we even got, we even went down a rabbit hole of saying, you know, eventually in the next couple, 
couple of years, hopefully it's not going to be called DLP anymore. It'll probably yeah. be called something else. Um, but really kind of provide advice and guidance in, in some of the areas and the challenges that we have, where I don't think that platform and that form was available, right? I think Slack has done a great job at allowing to bridge the gap and bringing security leaders together and allowing them to have side conversations within, you know, um, you know, security based Slack channels. Um, I, the IT world has similar stuff, right? With like the Mac admin channels and, and stuff like that, where mm -hmm. industry leaders are allowed to communicate and, and see pain points and learn from other people. But I think what VCs are really starting to do is they're saying, hey, security is a really tough space. It's a really tough area to solve. How can we leverage the best minds in the area um, to get and give better information to these entrepreneurs that are looking to build the next gen security tooling? So I think they're really yeah. doing it from that perspective and, and most likely obviously taking some of our commentary, right? And some of our feedback and saying, okay, you know, hey, this is particularly, I think a good investment opportunity or maybe, ah, it sounds like based on conversations with these councils, maybe not be a tooling that, that is gonna be adopted and, and you know, on their perspective may not have the return that they're looking for, right? So once again, I think just in general, what they're doing is great kind of allowing us to have a voice at the table to help build next gen security tooling. Um, in addition to, you know, for those tools that everybody's got a thumbs up for or, or really excited about going in and providing the appropriate funding in order for them to kind of fully build and bake out their product. I love that. I love the fact that we're starting to see this um, maturation in the VC space where they could, we're going beyond just, is this software problem product going to give the financial return we're looking for, but are we more fundamentally going to solve the right problems? All right. So getting your voice in that conversation, getting these other security leaders in that, in that conversation and being able to say, where should we put our money? Like what's got the, what's actually going to have the biggest return on solving real problems in the industry. And then of course, is the second piece, how would we operationalize this? How would we use this product on a day-to-day -day basis? And I think that two-way street, a two-way um, conversation is just so powerful. So I'm, I'm glad that you're part of those councils. I know you play your skill set down, but I think that voice, that, that practitioner's voice, that security executive's voice that you're able to bring to that is really benefiting everybody. Because now, instead of us having to all look around the corner and all see what's coming down the pike, there's got you and a handful of others who say, okay, this is the problems we're seeing. Somebody please go fund and build a company that solves these problems. So the rest of the security community can just go off the shelf and say, yep, I need one of those, and I need one of those, and I need one of those, yeah. right? And then we can just leverage the very best that these VCs are bringing to market. Yeah, and, and taking, you know, I think by bringing more and more individuals into these chats, right, into these forums, um, and working with some of the portfolio companies is to allow them to, to, to understand what we see being within an organization, what are the pain points, right? And what is a common denominator across the board with the 10 people who are in this room right now, or the five people that are in this room right now, or the 50 people that are in this room right now, right? We're all going to have some sort of common problem. Um, you know, so once again, it, it allows a VC firm to kind of make educated decisions. Hey, this is definitely a space that I want to be investing in. And they may say, hey, look, you know, this particular tooling that this company is trying to pitch us on, none of those guys, none of those 50 people, 10 people, five people have it on their, you know, top 100 priority list. So maybe it's an area that we want to pass on. So it's kind of a win-win situation for, for both individuals. And I think, you know, one of the important parts, you know, once again, that I, I, I'm very passionate about is, is giving back to the community. Um, yeah. You know, whether that's time to educate, whether that's time with people that want to get into the security space, whether that's internally within Clavio or any of the other organizations that I've worked with to kind of give them their, my, their, my time, um, feedback on how they can get into the space, the different, the different arms of information security, right? There's just so many different roles that somebody can have within our industry. I mean, kind of educating them on those different roles that, that they maybe say, hey, I've got a particular skill set here. Um, and, you know, working with these young entrepreneurs, some, some younger, some older, and the creative ideas that they have and help bring those to fruition and let them know what my pain points are and what I would like to see within a solution and how I'd want to see the solution deployed, which makes our, you know, site team's lives that much easier, right? If it's, if we can leverage Terraform um, or some of the other automations in place nowadays, um, it, they may not be thinking of all, they, they may solely be thinking of the product itself, right? And we could help provide direction so that they don't have some of the pitfalls that, that other companies that don't do this may have. That makes 
That's awesome. And so like, I know we could probably carry this conversation on for like another hour or two or such, but you know, if there are entrepreneurs out there who are really eager to jump into the security space and want your um, perspective and opinion, um, or if you've got investors out there who are also looking for another um, sound voice in the security community, is LinkedIn the best place to reach out with you? Where should we people be reaching out to learn more? Yeah, LinkedIn's probably the easiest avenue. Check LinkedIn pretty often. We're uh, we're hiring over at Clavio, so we've got a bunch of roles that we're hiring for uh, a, a couple teams. So I'm spending a lot of time searching for candidates on LinkedIn and um, you know posting on LinkedIn for for new opportunities that we have to come work on our team. But always always truthfully uh, willing to help out the community. Um, you know, spend a lot of time kind of helping some young Boston startups on. Hey, we're trying to move upstream in a specific vertical. How do we obtain, you know, ISO certification, or how do we go down the path of, you know, meeting HIPAA requirements and kind of spending time there to provide some advisory work, um, just to allow them to, to get to where they need to be. Right. Once again, it's, you know, we we can't operate in these silos organizationally, and not every company is going to have the budget, the resources, the tooling, technologies, you name it, in order to fully fund a security program. Right. But how do we help the young companies? Um, that are just getting up and running to avoid incurring a ton of security debt that later down the road, they're going to have to pay down, right? Maybe they want to play and, you know, work with Fortune 100, 500 companies. Well, we all know the requirements of third-party vendor due diligence, and those are only going to be increasing as, as time goes on. So how do we help these young companies establish the security fundamentals that they need to have in place, the appropriate safeguards to mitigate the risk to those customers that they want to work with? And then when they want to go through some sort of certification process, because it is a requirement or a check the box item, in order to get through and pass that, um, you know, risk committee on the other side of the table, um, you know, we've educated you, you've implemented those safeguards and you can be agile to go down the path to get a soft, you know, examination completed or ISO certification or, you know, PCI, you name it, right? Um, one of those three letter acronyms. But yeah, always willing to help. LinkedIn's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me and, and reach out to me via message and I'll do my best to, uh, to get back as soon as I can. Well, perfect. Well, I know you're an incredibly busy guy. So if you're a startup in the Boston area, you want some advice. If you're a VC and you want a sound opinion in the security market, or you're in the security community and you are just looking for a friend and an ally, um, we'll put Brian's link to LinkedIn in the show notes below. Well, Brian, thank you again for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast today. Connor, thank you so much. Really appreciate it.